going to talk now about the digital interior. Uh, specifically, I'm going to give you some thoughts on how things are evolving. And I want to have a disclaimer right up front. I reserve the right to completely uh, contradict what I've said in five minutes after I finish saying this. Um, I will be saying some obvious generalizations that will, you will all um, kind of take the grind. It's all intended to provoke debate, uh, and hopefully it will do so. All right, so with that disclaimer in mind, let's begin. We are in a very unique position at the moment. This is very obvious stuff. We are in the middle of this enormous transition. Our grandparents were analog. Our grandchildren will be purely digital. But we uniquely have a foot in both camps, and we can see the best and the worst of both worlds. Uh, and we are all currently in the middle of a massive social experiment. We are all addicted on some level to technology. And I'm going to have a little demonstration here. We've all been in a situation where we've been have, at a dinner party or in a cafe or chatting, and then someone gets their phone out. And they go, oh, hang on a second. I've just got to get this. And they leave. And when they leave, and don't lie, you want to leave too. Don't you want to pull your phone out now and check it <laughs> while I'm looking at my messages? Uh, well, I'm getting many yeses and a few noes, and that's fair enough. I'm glad there are some digital naysayers, and so there should be. But I would say one of the effects of the, the digital paradigm shift that we're in the middle of is that we are, we are addicts on some level to digital technology. That, I'm trying to think of a good name for that. that I think I'm calling it the, the Fomino effect, like Domino. It's not quite right, is it? Anyone's got a better name for that? The fact that when someone pulls out a phone, everyone else wants to pull one out. Please see me afterwards, and um, we can put it online. But yeah, I would say we're all addicted to tech. That's a nice... Illustration of that from the internet. Uh, you know, people walk around like this. And they're in there. They're there. They're not in the world. They're here. Um, and this is a very, very recent phenomenon. The first iPhone is 2007. That's only eight years ago. The first tablet is 2010. That's five years ago. So this is incredibly recent stuff. And we're still in the middle of this change. It hasn't, almost hasn't begun yet. You know, we're in transition, mass transition. Nobody knows where we are going. We are in the middle of this massive paradigm shift. And if anybody tells you, this is a piece of, of, of knowledge from a guy called Nick Roop, who's a digital guru. I quote him in saying, if someone comes up to you and tells you that they know what the world will look like in six months, do not trust them. You know for sure they are talking shit. Because nobody knows. You know, Google Glass, which they've now dumped, the smartwatches. At any moment, we're in a very unique time where it, within six months, the digital landscape could completely change. So that's the place we have to operate from, a place of disruption, a place of intense and relentless innovation. And there are lots of opinions as to whether this is a good or bad thing. And there are lots of books coming out at the moment. Here are a couple of them that would argue that this is not necessarily a good thing. Now, most people, I think, would say on the whole, this is a good thing. Certainly, younger generations are going, hooray, hooray. And I love my smartphone. I love my tablet. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a Luddite. But there are clearly some uh, cons as well as pros. Uh, this uh, book from a few years ago, a guy called Tim Wu, he argues that any new paradigm, any new media that emerges has an initial period of freedom and experimentation. Uh, and he cites radio, TV, cinema, where everyone kind of goes, hooray, let's do whatever we want, and this is fantastic, and it's a new paradigm. And then the corporates come along and lock down and go, hang on a second, enough play, enough for you creative experimental types, now it's time to make some money. And I think it is, you could argue that we are now in a period of monetization. And the last three, four years have been a place where instead of the lovely, fantastic experimentation that was happening on the internet, uh, we are now moving steadily to a place where monetization is the key. Global um, digital corporates like Google, Apple, uh, Facebook, Amazon, etc., they are, they are taking over and turning the internet into a place primarily for monetization. That's what the digital interior is, is currently for, I would argue. And this is why net neutrality is so important, because as soon as you let the actual fabric of the internet be controlled by digital corporates, we really are screwed. Um, so I would also argue that this explosion, this paradigm shift, is currently moving away beyond the screen and back into the physical world. We've been pretty much primarily focused on screen-based digital interior, screen-based interactions, but the current signs are that we're now moving beyond that. And this is the beginning of something, uh, the next phase. And it's been called the Maker Movement by Chris Anderson, editor of Wired, uh, who's written books about it. Uh, digital fabrication is enormous. Smart devices uh, are enormous. W wearable tech is, is currently the big thing. And um, 
Also, you have this kind of backlash with the big um, boom in things like vinyl, letterpress, screen printing, where people are kind of craving more analog interactions. So we are into the next phase. And here, I would again argue that this is where there are, there are no certainties, even more than the digital world. There are loads of social marketing digital gurus at the moment, but no one at the moment really knows what's going to go on when we have fully permeated tech within interiors. When you come in, people talk about, yeah, we're going to go into your house and kind of you'll have clicked the kettle when you're halfway down the road and it'll be boiling when you walk in and you can know what's in your fridge, all that sort of stuff. It's still, maybe, but maybe not. No one quite knows. So this is the area. And certainly I, as a, when I started Airside with Nat and Alex, we were very lucky at that point. That was the area of creativity, of experimentation. Anything went, we could be very innovative. And now that opportunity has moved into the physical, I would say. So the place where digital and physical really are merging, that's where the opportunity still is for bold creative thinking from creative, the creative sector. And that's really exciting. So I would argue that our current screen-based relationship is primarily a solitary one. Um, this is the ubiquitous experience of screens. And uh, according to The Economist recently, the, the social uh, ramifications of that are, A, crime and drug use is down, and B, in young people, and B, depression and obesity is up. Because everybody's sitting at home with their laptop eating pizza because they can't afford to go out and rob a post office or score some crack cocaine. Um, but the problem is that the current digital interior is designed for an occupancy of one, I would argue. And I'm going to argue this through a bunch of diagrams and then with a funny cartoon that makes the point far, far better than I possibly could. In traditionally, you had a range of experiences. You had the analog immersive interactions here, and, and you could have them on your own. You could read a book, you could knit, you can meditate, you could be really into your own personal space. Or you could have a more social, communal, immersive interaction. I'm talking about real engagement, where you're really kind of consumed by passion, you're transformed out of your body. You could go to a gig, you could go to a really good dinner party, you could go to a football match. Now, in the digital space, there are equivalents to this, but it's far more down the bottom end of the scale. You get to surf the web, you get to send your email, you get to look at Facebook, and you are getting a bit more sociable here, certainly, and Twitter and so on are more social, but they still say they're restricted to a primarily singular um, interaction. You then get uh, World of Warcraft. My son, when he went to university, his whole social life was based on running around with his mates in, in World, World of Warcraft, killing orcs and, and, and so on. They, rather than go to the pub, they do that. Um, Skype, obviously, is pushing it even further that way. But are there any true communal, digital, immersive interactions? I say possibly not. And here's the cartoon that makes that whole point much better than I did with those graphs. Your life is spent, all the activities you do are fundamentally the same interaction with sitting at a screen, and someone's going to come up with an app that will solve it, but won't actually solve it. Um, so one of the reasons why this is the case is that uh, the theory is that you split these kind of on-screen interactions into two, two primary modes. There's sit forward at your computer, and then more traditional TV-based interactions are lean back. And um, sit forward is the mode in which we create. So most digital content is created in the sit forward mode. So it's very easy to make that the default um, mode for interaction, uh, interaction with it. No one's yet nailed true digital interaction in a more sociable space there. And this lean back thing, people are all over it. They're trying to make it work. This is YouTube lean back. Uh, so you know, YouTube are trying to make it work. This hasn't taken a call on yet, but they're still clearly trying to make it work. Um, but I don't think that sit forward lean back is the whole story. I think it's a very reduced area of interactions. Um, this is a bunch of students, uh, a picture I found on the internet, a bunch of students in America having a good time. And they're sitting around, probably two or three in the morning, slightly, slightly baked, having a laugh. And this is where I engage with a lot of really uh, uh, powerful content. And I'm talking about primarily music here, because that's one of my main fields. And at the moment, the digital response to that space is a bunch of kids scrabbling over a laptop trying to play YouTube clips in turn. And I think that's a bit reductive. I think we can do a lot better than that. Here's a much wider range of potential interactions with music. Using those two kind of metrics of the solo, the communal, and the immersive, and the ambient, you can sit at home listening to music on your computer here. You can be on hold. That's much more kind of, I don't really care. It's a bit more neutral. But then up here, you've got kind of the gig. Where is the digital equivalent of, of what's happening up here? And I'd say there's a whole range of spaces and a range of, of interactions that digital has yet to explore that go beyond the basic headphones, computer, laptop setup. Um, and as I say, I think the technology is currently emerging to give us an opportunity to do that. So you're saying to me, so what, Fred? 
show me some, something that says how I might engage with it. Well, this is my response to it, which is an installation I'm going to show you very quickly. I've got a two-minute film. Uh, this is a commission from uh, the La Gaieté Lyrique in Paris, who are France's national um, digital archive, national digital centre. And they asked uh, me and my team to come up with an installation that was scalable, that could, could engage one person or 20 people, that was uh, engaging when you weren't looking at it, that when you weren't interacting with it, rather, but that was a spectacle for other people to watch when you did interact with it, uh, and wasn't soporific, wasn't screen-based. Anyway, here's two minutes of this. Hopefully. Gaeta approached us because they had this game exhibition called Jules Le Jeu and the curator gave us a call and they wanted us to brand the exhibition and then to our delight they actually also wanted us to do a piece of this amazing space, the Moulin Mezzanine here at the Gaeta. And they wanted something really powerful and mind-blowing to kind of uh, kick off the exhibition. There's so much of a link between the playfulness of games and that of music. So Electricity Comes From Other Planets for me is something that really uh, ties this together the most closely because the playfulness of your body and moving in it is what creates the musical patterns and allows people that are playing together uh, to collaborate to make, basically to mix their own music physically, but through discovery. These planets are, are generating uh, power. If you don't interact with them, they're in a sleep state. As soon as you start playing with them, they start giving back to you. They start flashing along with the music. You can play them individually and they work like that. You can just explore what the, the piano sounds like or the strings sound like. Or you can play the drums or the bass together and start combining a couple of elements. And when you do that, the, the piece gives you more visuals. Triggering music in a real world space in a new way, in an interactive way, was something we really wanted to play with. It's really amazing I, and I, I feel like um, a child. <laughs> yeah, it's really creative. And I like listening to the sound and also um, seeing the, the different colors and forms. And wow, it's just wow. <laughs> And there's a longer version of that on, online. But I think the point I'm trying to make here is that that is the, basically the same functionality as a Candy Crush app that you might play on, on a pair of headphones on your, on your smartphone, but it's transplanted into the real world. And the way we had to do that was through disguising the screen-based interaction by using projection mapping onto these sculptures in order to make you feel like you weren't looking at a bunch of screens. You were looking at something that was broadcasting towards you instead. So there's more information about that on my website. But um, that's my response. Um, my mate in Silicon Valley says, startups these days, they won't get funded unless they have this magic three. Three is the magic number. You need business, you need a business head that's going to make you a billion dollars. You need the tech to be absolutely bang on. But now we have design at the table as well. Right built into the beginning of any innovative startup venture, they, the money men say, if you haven't got a designer at the table, then it's not worth investing in. This is new. We've never been, I'm, I'm assuming I'm talking to an audience full of creative people, I'm sure I am. We've never been at top table before. You know, this is a new development. And I say that in these situations, the best formats, the innovation always comes initially from a creative perspective. And I would argue people like Alex Steinweiss, who invented the album sleeve. When the albums are called albums, because they used to come in cardboard, cardboard sleeves, and um, he just one day, he's an illustrator, and he said, what about if I drew a drawing on this sleeve and then it will sell? And it, that worked. People like Bjork are experimenting with the format. If Apple come up with the format, if, if HP or Bosch or whoever it is, they commission someone to design it for them to fit their business metrics, I don't think it's going to work because I don't think it's going to work in that model. I think it needs, it needs a creative solution to take us forward, to create these solutions, to make communal digital interiors of the future, rather than the singularity that I say is the currently the norm. And that is it. Thank you very much.